Well, hello, good and welcome to another session with Jeremiah, going through Jeremiah, kind of jumping through Jeremiah a little bit, but Jeremiah, if you haven't been picking up the earlier episodes of this or haven't taken up the first two chapters of Jeremiah, we're taking up the third chapter today. And uh, we're kind of seeing the heart of God bear himself out. That's what's precious about the book of Jeremiah. A couple things are beautiful. Number one, God bears his heart out like no other book that as he's is he coming for pleading. And then the second is Jeremiah not wanting to serve as a young man. God taps him on the shoulder in chapter one. But we also see, oh my goodness, as we go through here, just look at everything that he deals with for 40 years. No wonder why he's called the weeping prophet. And then we're going to look at the prophets, the false prophets that come up, right? The false prophets will certainly be showing themselves. And then we're going to see, we're going to see something come up here where the people, they think something's to be true and they find out it's not to be true. That's always a lot of regret is when you thought something to be true and it turns out not to be true. And that's going on today. People think that God would have to do this or think that God would be doing that. And you know what? When you look into the word of God on things, I don't see some of this. I, 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 don't, I really don't see where, where God would have that. I could get into it now, but it's, this is the big aha moment that these, that these people want here in Jeremiah's day is they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to have their own way of doing their own things and attach themselves to Jehovah and his name. So we're going to read about that here in chapter 3. So let's get over here. Chapter 3 of Jeremiah. They say, if a man divorces his wife and he goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? Would you have played the heart with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord? Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see, where have you not lain with men? By the road you have sat for them like an Arabian in the wilderness, and you have polluted the land with your harlotries and your wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld. There have been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Will you not from this time cry to me? My father, you are the guide of my youth. Will you remain angry for will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things, and you were able. So I think this is a, a very interesting as he comes out uh, going here, but let's get into this portion here, verse six, where Judah ignores Israel's example. As I said last time, the 10 tribes have been carried off here. And so Jehovah now can say, can't you not look at your sister Israel and see what she did? So it says here in verse six, the Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. There you go. So God was pleading with Israel, the 10 tribes. And, and Judah didn't listen to it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I'd put her away and gave her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not returned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense says the Lord. You know, this brings up an interesting thing about examples. You know, Solomon would say there is nothing new under the sun. And so, you know, years ago we had chickens. And 
the idea would be is that you would have a fr- these were layers and so the idea would be there would be a f- fresh flock of chickens that were producing in 18 months so there every 18 months there was a new f- new flock of hens that were going to be producing and our property borders the grapes the vineyard next door and coyotes come running through there well when we had chickens we had uh, invariably certain kinds of hens that would sit there and I did everything I could do to keep, to put, I put up, I put up special wire along the fence, etc., to keep the chickens from squeezing through the fence and getting out into the vineyard. Because when you go out there, invariably there would be a, a pile of feathers. A coyote would come through, grab a hold of one, shake it and run off and have chicken dinner. And so I would go out there, and I'm like, oh, where's the holes? And I would try to patch the holes because I didn't want to lose any more chickens, okay? And that would happen once or twice a year. You know, the next year come along, the next batch come along, and guess what? Interesting enough, again, there would be a couple hens, just a couple hens, find themselves out scratching in the vineyard, and they too would have a pile of feathers, and I looked at that and go, that's just the way that we, we people are, isn't it? Isn't that just the way it is? You know, one generation comes, one generation goes, there's nothing new under the earth, and we keep repeating the same thing. And these hens didn't know that the last generation of hens, yeah, they, as they squeezed through, they didn't realize that there was hens that squeezed through uh, probably 16, 12 months before, and there's a pile of feathers out there. It's a small little example that, you know, their little beanie brains didn't catch a hold of the fact that, you know what, that happened before out there, pile of feathers. And yet today we follow after our idols. You know, interesting enough, as we go through here, that's the biggest thing about this is backsliding, leaving God out of the picture, following after idols. We took that up last last time in chapter two about about giving up the living waters and going after cisterns with broken cisterns trying to hold water. And so today we've got something going on where Satan comes along and we don't necessarily have these, 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 uh, idols of, of, um, of stone and wood and things like that. No, no, we now have, we now have stuff that is electronic. It's got a little electricity going on. It's a, it's the same kind of, it's the same, it it does the same purpose, little built a little differently. It doesn't have all the same technology, none of the chips in there that the the old folks didn't have the chips back in the day. These ones in Judah had their idols. And we read earlier there, let's go back over there to there too. We read earlier there where it says, um, where it says there that verse, yeah, verse, what is that? Verse uh, six, she has gone up in every high mountain and under every green tree and there played the harlot. And, you know, the high, the high places were, is, is where they would play the harlot. So they would have, had, had their little idols outside of town, if you will. Later on, they had full-on idols in town in Jerusalem. But they had their idol idols out there, and that's where they got to go play the harlot out there. But it's, oh, they still had Jehovah. They still had his place there. They still had his temple. Uh, we still got Jehovah here, but we'll just go play the idols as well, okay? So anyway, well, that's enough. Let's jump over on over to um, what Gabe Line has on this. So this is interesting. We'll just take we'll just take right up up in here in verses six through eleven. The message which begins with the sixth verse. This is uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter three verse six. To Jeremiah during the reign of Josiah, there is then first of all a contrast between Israel, the ten tribes, and her sister Judah. Compare with Ezekiel 23. The house of Israel, the northern kingdom, was judged first by the Lord. She played the harlot. After she had done so, the Lord said, Turn to me. She refused, and her treacherous sister, the house of Judah, saw it. And when the Lord dealt with the house of Israel in judgment, and they were carried away, Judah did not fear, but played the harlot. The 10th verse proves conclusively that the Reformation under Josiah was not a true spiritual revival. Now, if you go back and read jo- uh, Josiah, that account in Second Kings, you see tremendous things Josiah was doing, absolutely tremendous. That was a time that he was bringing Reformation to the land. But interesting enough, when we have to get into Jeremiah here, and we find out that 
you know what? Josiah was doing it. He was doing it for the Lord, but turns out the hearts, the part of the people weren't with it. The heart of the people just kind of didn't show a little bit. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting aha moment here for me is, um, the 10th verse proves conclusively that the reformation under Josiah was not a true spiritual revival. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not returned to me with her whole heart, whole heart, but faintly with the Lord, saith the Lord, you know, and, um, going back to, do you remember what was said? Uh, the seven churches, remember we see the seven churches in revelation two and three, do you remember he said, what he says about the first church? Man, the first church, Ephesus, was just was just tremendous. And you know that you know if you know the, the book of Revelation, or at least the first couple chapters, you find out that as he addresses the, as Christ addresses the churches after that, why everything's in declension after the first church. But the only thing that Ephesus had, the only thing as beautiful as Ephesus was, and of course you can read the epistle to the Ephesians and you can see the highest truths that they were given by Apostle Paul. But when John's writing Revelation and the Lord Jesus is giving him words to these seven churches and now this church of Ephesus, what is the thing that he says about Ephesus that wasn't good? There's only one thing. Thou hast left thy first love. You've given up your first love. Is that easy for us to do? Is that easy for us to do is to give up our first love? It's it's solemn. It's solemm. And so, you know, Judah, Judah's playing the same game here where, you know, he he she wants to still have a little of Jehovah, but she wants her idols out there as well. And so that's truly when we don't go after the Lord with a true heart, full heart, 100% heart, and give up our first love. And so it's important to get a hold of that. So let's go back here and just go through here. Um, uh, let's see here. It says um, verses 12 through 18, here's a message to be proclaimed toward the north calling on backsliding Israel to return his promises return mer, uh, he promises mercy to them and 100 years before the house of Israel had gone northward as captives right so so Judah could look on and, and see this as plain history this is what happened to them the Lord knew where they dwelt and sent them this message of mercy he knows today where the house of Israel is the 10 tribes and this and at some future time the gracious offer given here will be consummated in their return, these verses are prophetic. So this is verses 12 through 18. They speak of a time when the chosen people will return. Then Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord. Israel will be converted. All the nations will be gathered into the na name of Jehovah. The house of Judah with the house of Israel will be united. This will be when the king, our ever blessed Lord, comes back. Boy, isn't that, isn't that lovely to pick that up right now? Is at this time, those 10 tribes got carried away. And to this day, to this day, uh, what was that, 2,500 years ago? To this day, we don't know where those 10 tribes are. But God, in his infinite wisdom, is going to bring those 10 tribes back. And now he's going to bring the two tribes back too. We only have a little smidgen of the two tribes back there in Israel right now. But look at on what's going on right now in Israel, and it's just like, this is going to be a beautiful day someday, a beautiful day when the Lord Jesus comes back and he does his, his war and, and, and convicts his earthly people, Judah and Israel, and they're reunited, reunited. That's a beautiful thing coming up. I just, I, I rejoice to see it because the Lord Jesus will be King of Kings, Lord of Lords, reign on this earth. And yes, all the nations will be serving him. We, the church, will be watching as a bride will watch to see our Lord accomplish this because the last time this world saw him was they spit upon him and they said, away with this man. That's the last time that the world has seen him. But there'll be a day, and it may not be too soon from, it may not be too far from here, when we will uh, be able to see our Lord Jesus take his rightful place on his own throne on his own throne there in Jerusalem. I, I, I just, I just, 
I get a rejoicing to think that that all of God's the stuff that we're reading here in Jeremiah will come back together. The ten tribes will be coming back. The two tribes and everybody's heart is going to be fully towards the Lord in that day. Well, I hope you find that to be encouraging, despite as we go through everything, you know, knowing the fact that uh, it is it is something that um, it's a day that's not too far off, not too far off to see the Lord. And uh, but we have to take a hold of Jeremiah and see God's viewpoint, see man's viewpoint, and see how that applies to me today because it's not that far off. And know the fact that the Lord Jesus will have his rightful place and the glory evermore be the kingdom and dominion.